I want you to imagine a scenario, if you would. The year is 2010. It's about 2.30 in the morning on a school night. You awake to a dimly lit room, the only source of light emanating from your old Philips TV. You don't know why you're awake, only that you probably shouldn't be up at this hour. Was it the George Lopez show that woke you up? That would make sense. It's usually super late at night when that show comes on, and the intro is always super loud for some reason. Nevertheless, you reach for the TV remote, determined to go back to bed and wake up early for school the next morning. Only, when you look at the TV, instead of being met by George Lopez's handsome mug, you are met with this. into a show like no other. And that show is called Avatar The Last Airbender. What I have just described was my first ever interaction with Avatar The Last Airbender. It's a show that at this point needs absolutely no introduction. A show that so many people remember fondly for so many different reasons, and a show that is still, to this day, talked about passionately online as if it were still airing. It's a show that has been so thoroughly dissected that I have genuinely struggled to write or say anything new about the show that has not been said before by people who are likely countless times way smarter than I am when it comes to literary analysis. It's something that everyone and their mom has at least seen or heard about, and if you don't, what rock have you been living under? The purpose of this video is twofold. Firstly, to convince those of you who haven't seen the series to check it out, and two, to get those of you who, like me, have already seen it, to go back and reevaluate it on a second watch and really understand how deep this silly little kid's show is. While I will try and avoid major spoilers, the show has been out for almost <laughs> 20 years! So it's inevitable that I will be going over major events in the story, and thusly I will add timestamps for those who want to enjoy the show blind. So without further ado, let's align our chakra, enter the Avatar state, and break down why you should still watch Avatar The Last Airbender. The success of Avatar is one that I believe rests on three major contributing factors. One, the characters and the level of their writing. Two, the magic slash combat system, and three, the depth of world building. And while we'll get into the later points in a few minutes, for now let's start with the characters. For me, a show often lives or dies because of its characters, and luckily, The Last Airbender has one of the most entertaining casts of almost any show I've ever seen. Whether they be a member of the main cast, a secondary role, or even the cabbage guy, every single character is a blast to follow along with each character not just being made of one or two things that separate them, but a series of aspects that gradually build to form a character that feels real while still having enough quirks that help them stand out from one another, being further helped by a key understanding of character design. Take the main character of Aang as an example. He starts the show as a fun-loving, good-natured kid, his airbending abilities giving him this free-spirited, almost whimsical childlike charm, these aspects being further helped by his design. Everything from his shorter stature, simple features, and clothes to bring to mind a child's uniform serving to give Aang a younger, more friendly look. Meanwhile, the sometimes glowy arrow tattoos, bow staff, and general posing all culminating to give it across the idea that Aang is an ultimately friendly character, but one that has, can, and will defend himself if need be. His later design evolving the former into one that maintains the friendly look but with a much more experienced character behind it. And what I find super interesting is just how the same philosophy carries over for almost every single character in the show. Katara's necklace serving as a reminder of who she is, her culture, and her role on Team Avatar, Sokka's weapons and outfit looking more like a warrior archetype, or even how Zuko's uptight hair, scar, and pointy armor awarding him a villainous look at the start of the show, only for him to lose the armor, have this in-between state where he's figuring himself out, and finally his clothes loosening up and his hair framing his face more gently as he becomes an ally later on. Growth being a major theme of Avatar, it not only applies to the character designs, but also to the very characters themselves. Take the aforementioned Sokka as a perfect example. 
Sokka starts off the show as this ambitious, overly cautious, and even straight up sexist character. It's not until later on where he meets the Kyoshi Warriors, gets his ass handed to them, and then through his own experiences, does he realize that he needs to change his ways. And to his credit, he does, becoming a better friend and more importantly, a better leader because of it. And again, almost every single character in the show undergoes the same level of development and growth. Only one who doesn't change a lot is Toph, and even then, Toph still shows occasional moments of growth. It's this growth that is exemplified through no better character than Zuko, who is, to this very day, I and many others consider to have one of the single best character arcs in any show I've ever seen, starting the series hellbent on capturing the Avatar and restoring his honor before gradually coming to terms with his own morality and finally being a full-on friend to the group, and eventually even helping to overthrow the very father he desperately sought his approval from. Bending in a lot of ways is a very interesting combat system. It's an extremely simple magic system that, while simple to understand on the surface, like the rest of the show, has a lot more depth than just what meets the eye. On the surface, there are four elements, air, water, earth, and fire. These elements become combined with various fighting styles, allowing certain people the ability to move or bend said element. Truthfully, if that were it, if bending was just a way to facilitate interesting action, then this explanation perfectly serves its purpose. However, just like the rest of the show, bending goes so much deeper than that. While all benders can only bend one element, the Avatar, and in this case Aang, is the master of all four elements. And as the show follows Aang, an airbender, on his journey to learn the other elements, we as an audience also get to learn more about bending. Airbending was developed by air nomads, who use the element in their everyday lives and is generally about having more freedom, not only physically, but also spiritually and mentally. Water is the element of change, and so a lot of water bending is about going with the flow and using any source of water to your advantage. Earth bending is probably the most physically demanding style, owing a lot to its basis in kung fu. Earth bending requires its users to stay strong like boulders, facilitating a greater number of heavier strikes than its elemental counterparts. Firebending is actually somewhat unique amongst the other elements, whereas the other elements at the very least require some form of said element in order to be able to bend, firebending is the only one that is produced directly from its user, meaning that firebending does not require an active flame or heat source to use, which by default makes them the most dangerous benders and perfectly frames the Fire Nation as a credible threat to the rest of the world. And while these basic outlines serve to help our understanding of how these elements and bending as a whole work, it's because of the journey, the culture, and the people of Avatar that the world begins to feel flushed out. Bending, while being the main form of combat in the show, also works as a conduit for which the entire world of Avatar The Last Airbender operates. The aforementioned villainous Fire Nation as a whole use firebending as a constant threat to the other nations, made all the more dangerous as their flames are used to power their industrial war machines. The earthbending city of Omashu's buildings and slides are made entirely out of stone, allowing both citizens and goods easy transportation with the help of the city's earthbenders. Or even how waterbending is primarily taught to the men, while the women benders are relegated to healing and working as nurses, ultimately holding the Northern Water Tribe back when it comes time to face the Fire Nation. Bending can even be used on things that would logically make sense in the real world. Take sub-bending, for instance. Sub-bending being bending styles that don't quite fit neatly into the other four elements. Earthbenders are able to move sand because it's mineral composition, and Toph later develops metal bending because the impurities and rocks inside metal. Waterbenders can freely turn water into ice because of its chemical composition, use as healing treatments, or even do blood bending, a style of water bending that allows someone to control another living being by water bending the water inside blood. Hell, even certain firebenders can bend and lightning. Lightning bending works particularly well for two reasons. One, it makes sense because lightning is just plasma, which is just superheated fire. And two, it works in universe because it was developed by firebenders who studied water bending techniques, culture, and beliefs and applied them to fire bending. I forgot to mention combustion bending, but you get the idea. Sub-bending ultimately works because it gives the characters in world more flexibility depending on the scenario. Bending also works in more subtle ways, as how a bender uses their element can tell us a lot about them. 
Azula, pretty uniquely, has a blue flame when firebending, something not seen with any other firebender in the show. It demonstrates that her utter mastery of firebending is perfect and also works to contrast with her brother Zuko. It shows that her baseline level of talent is greater than Zuko, and this paired with how casually she throws out much hotter fire, perfectly encapsulating how she is considered a prodigy and how she works tirelessly to always one-up and undermine her brother. All in all, bending works as a dead simple concept that is easy to understand, but one that the show runs with, creating not only entertaining fights, but also adding to... The sheer scale of world building that The Last Airbender has is one that I think genuinely needs to be studied. For me personally, it's up there with series like One Piece in terms of how well fleshed out every aspect of this world is. Everything from its architecture, its people, their cultures and motivations, history, to just the weird hybrid animals feel like they belong, and if you were to remove any of it, the entire show would fall apart. Something that the live action shows and movies fail at every time. Spoilers for all three seasons, by the way. As an example of how fleshed out the world is, let's talk about the bison whistle. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Early on in the show, the gang traveled to a small waterside village where Aang is presented with a supposedly authentic bison whistle. Aang, desperate to hold on to any remnants of his dead culture, buys it from the shady merchant. He tries it out, only for it to not work, while Sokka declares it was a fake, only for it later to help them escape capture because it was a real bison whistle. On the surface, cool, now they have a reliable way to summon Appa, and it proves Sokka's smart ass wrong. But let's zoom out a bit and view the whistle as a cog in the overarching story of the show. Just by itself, the whistle shows us multiple things. A, that Aang is desperate to hang on to his culture. B, that shady individuals like the shopkeep exist. And that C, ancient relics are passed around. So let's break these points down. Aang is desperate to hang on to his culture and so haggles with the shopkeep for the whistle, despite the fact that he probably got ripped off. The shady shopkeep having stolen the item implies that the whistle was likely looted from somewhere and that, if the whistle is authentic, it means that old air temples were likely pillaged by the Fire Nation or picked clean by looters after the massacre. Zooming out further, looters, along with the fact that the temples are still standing, means that people have and actively are at the old air nomad homes, like those at the northern air temples. Finally, if we zoom out even farther, the whistle is also shown to work on other animals and is a known method for summoning Appa. In Season 2, we see Aang combine the whistle with his airbending to create a sonic boom to get the intention of every animal in Ba Sing Se, and the leader of the corrupt Dai Li uses a very similar whistle to lure Appa into the city so that he can capture him away from our heroes, implying that they're either reverse-engineered a bison whistle or that he's simply using a similar one against the gang. With all of this taken into account, let's just look at how far the world of The Last Airbender has expanded, and all because of one whistle. The best part being that damn near anything, anyone, or anywhere can expand the world just like this one little example, giving Avatar the benefit of having lots of world building in almost every aspect completely organically. So what's my point then? The show has good characters, magic system, and the world building, but so what? Why should you still watch a show that ended in 2008, nearly 16 years later? Firstly, what do you think the last three chapters were about? And secondly, it's here where we need to get a little meta and discuss the other media that Avatar has delved into and how, unfortunately, for whatever reason, how none of them even hold a candle to the original series. Starting with... Oh god, not you. Look, I'm not going to lie to you, a lot of Avatar's expanded media is at best underwhelming and at worst downright bad. The original live action movie has a whole host of issues. From its whitewashed cast, terrible CGI, and the fact that they called him Ong and not Aang, this film is a dead horse that has been beaten a thousand times. And while the 2024 live action Netflix show fixes almost all of that and more, I, along with many others, can't help but feel that it's missing the heart and soul of the original, owing a lot to the fact that the original writers and creators left the series very early in production. The last Airbender sequel show, The Legend of Korra, is a marked improvement, but one that ultimately fails to live up to the expectations of its predecessor. Don't get me wrong, Korra certainly has its fans, and rightfully so. It has its high points, and personally speaking, I find the world to be a bit more interesting mechanically. 
The villains are a lot more fleshed out than the Fire Lord, and it's cool to see how the world has grown and evolved since the events of The Last Airbender. Unfortunately though, Korra's lows feel way more frequent than its highs, with it being plagued with unending love triangles, ass-pulled plot saves, occasionally bad CGI, and the Nickelodeon higher-ups constant meddling, and the fact that the show was pulled from TV and put its last season strictly online while still airing mid-season 3. The graphic novels are generally pretty good, as they follow the original show's continuity, but are considered more of a mixed bag the longer you go. And as for video games, they're bad. 99% of Avatar games are just plain bad. Even its newest title, Quest for Balance, despite advertising itself as a playable version of the show, is dissolved into mindless combat, menial block puzzles, and temple run knockoffs. A lot of people will come to very different conclusions as to why Avatar's expanded media doesn't work, and while I can't speak to what goes on behind the scenes, Honestly, more than anything, I view that more so that it's exactly because Avatar is such an airtight story. Its world is written so meticulously that changing almost anything causes unforeseen consequences. A combat system so well thought out that it becomes a nightmare to adapt. Its characters written so wholeheartedly that the Korra descendants absolutely pale in comparison. Every single aspect of Avatar The Last Airbender so perfectly melts together to create one of the most compelling pieces of fiction of the 21st century. One so good that nothing has been able to live up to it since. A show that tackled death, genocide, colonialism, war, imperialism, and a show that can still teach full grown adults messages they never thought they would need. As we near the end of this video, I want to talk about a scene that hit me particularly hard on one of my more recent rewatches of the show. It's the scene in season two where Zuko, after trying to settle for a peaceful life with his uncle, eventually relapses into his villainous ways as he tries to kidnap Appa, only to be confronted with the only voice of reason in his life. Uncle Iroh. Iroh, desperate to try and show his nephew that he can still choose his own path, pleads with him, reminding him of his past failures. What do you plan to do now that you have found the Avatar's bison? Keep it locked in our new apartment? Zuko firing back how you would expect any angry teenager to. Stop it, Uncle! I have to do this! And Iroh verbally dismantles Zuko, forcing his angry and confused nephew to confront the reality. The reality that the path he set on is one that was set upon him by someone else, and that there is always another path he could choose. Ending his speech with, It's time for you to look inward and begin asking yourself the big questions. Who are you? And what do you want? This scene, watching it as a kid, was a big moment for Zuko as he struggles with his morality but ultimately does the right thing. But watching this again at 16, as someone who could easily put himself in Zuko's shoes as a scared, angry, confused teenager hit way closer to home than I would have otherwise expected or cared to admit. It's a quote that has stuck with me even now, even after I graduated high school, even after I started making videos. It's one that has stuck with me. Who am I? And what do I want? And at the end of the day, that's what Avatar is. A show about extremely well-written characters, a fantastic combat system, and an amazing world. It's a show about people. A world with that emotional core of who they are and what they want. A show that you should still watch called Avatar The Last Airbender.